Welcome to our video on metal toxicity. Let's get started. In this lecture, we'll cover lead, arsenic, mercury, and iron toxicities. For each metal toxicity, we'll cover the definition, pathophys, risk factors, clinical presentation, diagnosis, and its management. So let's start with a definition of lead toxicity. Lead is a heavy metal that has no physiological role inside the body. Though no amount of lead in the body is safe, Clinicians consider a blood level of greater than or equal to 5 micrograms per deciliter as elevated. In other words, zero is most normal, but you really don't consider anything abnormal until it's above 5, as listed here. Now in adults, lead poisoning is diagnosed if a blood lead level is greater than or equal to 10 micrograms per deciliter, and accompanied by known signs or symptoms of lead poisoning, which we'll discuss later in this presentation. Now in children, the diagnosis of lead poisoning is divided into mild, moderate, and severe, and it hinges predominantly on the blood lead levels at the time of diagnosis. Now, mild lead poisoning is defined by blood lead levels between 5 and 44. Moderate is defined as a level between 45 and 69, and severe is equal to or greater than 70. Now, it's important to memorize these blood lead levels because those define the severity of the lead poisoning in children, because really the appropriate treatment depends entirely on that concentration level. Lead can be introduced into the body via the respiratory tract, the GI tract, or even the skin. Now once inside, it spreads via the circulatory system and deposits extensively throughout the skeletal system, where it can be stored and gradually released back into the circulation over decades. Now lead exerts its toxic effects in several ways. It weakens the immune system, it creates free radicals that can damage DNA and cell membranes, and it disrupts many biochemical pathways by interfering with enzymes. Examples of such pathways include purine metabolism, vitamin D synthesis, and heme synthesis. Now, lead's interference with heme synthesis specifically is frequently tested on the boards, so let's take a moment to discuss that in more detail. Here's an illustration of the heme synthesis pathway that should be familiar from step one. Lead inhibits heme synthesis by interfering with two key enzymes, ALA dehydratase and ferroketolase. Inhibition of these two enzymes leads to decreased production of heme, which leads to a type of microcytic anemia known as sideroblastic anemia. Here's an x-ray of a knee joint to help illustrate deposition of lead in the skeletal system. By ways of orientation, here's the femur, the tibia, and the fibula. Note the dense white line traversing horizontally across the metaphysis of the tibia, which formed as a result of lead deposition. Now of note, obtaining radiographs is not essential to the workup of lead poisoning, as this radiographic finding is uncommon unless the blood lead levels are very high. In other words, it's those serum lead levels that you're looking for. The risk factors for lead toxicity stem primarily from exposure to lead at home or at work. Now in adults, Occupational exposure is one of the most notable risk factors, and it can be seen in people working in plumbing, construction, or manufacturing of ammunition or batteries. Generally speaking, if a question stem describes a patient's occupation, it is probably a significant clue into the correct answer. In addition to occupational exposure, alcohol distillation, particularly using parts with lead soldering, is also a testable risk factor for lead toxicity in adults. In children, Risk factors for lead poisoning include homes built before 1978, homes with peeling lead paint or recent renovations, low socioeconomic status, recent immigration to the United States, siblings with known lead poisoning, and pica. Now, homes built before 1978 are considered a risk factor because they are more likely to have been built with lead-based paint when compared to more modern homes. Now, peeling lead paint is a direct source of lead exposure, and it can often be uncovered following home renovations. Low socioeconomic status and recent immigration to the United States increases the likelihood of children living in older homes or older apartment buildings. Now, if a sibling of a child was previously diagnosed with lead poisoning, it's more likely that the child was exposed to lead as well. Finally, pica is an eating disorder that describes consumption of items with no nutritional value such as dirt, or potentially paint chips containing lead. Now, presence of any of these risk factors in a child warrants screening for lead poisoning, so you're going to be drawing a venous lead level. The clinical features of lead toxicity are broad, which can make the diagnosis challenging. 
Now, some patients, both adults and children, can present with only nonspecific symptoms, such as fatigue, irritability, or even just GI symptoms, such as abdominal pain or constipation. Others may present with more serious symptoms, such as sensory or motor neuropathy, or cognitive impairment that can manifest as forgetfulness in adults, or neurodevelopmental delay in children. Notably, peripheral neuropathy, secondary to lead toxicity, often manifests on exams as foot drop, wrist drop, or sensory neuropathy in the stocking glove distribution. Now, exposure to lead can also lead to nephropathy, type 2 renal tubular acidosis, and, as we saw earlier in the presentation, sideroblastic anemia, which is a type of microcytic anemia. Now, finally, physical exam of patients with lead toxicity can reveal a Burton's line, which is a purple-blue line on the gums. Let me show you what this looks like. So here we see an example of Burton's line and how this will look in a patient with chronic lead poisoning, often described as a purple-blue line on the gums. In children specifically, acute severe lead poisoning with blood lead levels of over 70 can be particularly dangerous as it can lead to accumulation of high levels of lead in the brain, which can lead to fluid accumulation in the brain and lead to massive cerebral edema. This in turn can lead to acute encephalopathy, irreversible brain damage, and even brain herniation, which would be fatal. The diagnosis of lead toxicity begins with a careful history and physical exam looking for likely sources of lead exposure, as well as signs or symptoms of lead poisoning. In children, laboratory evaluation should start with a screening finger stick lead test, which, if elevated, should be confirmed with a venous lead level. In adults, a clinician should obtain a venous lead level directly, and that can actually be elevated in cases of lead toxicity, which is fairly intuitive. But the idea here is that in adults, you're actually skipping that finger stick test and going straight to the venous. Now, if the CBC is ordered, it can reveal a microcytic anemia due to lead's interference with heme synthesis. And other notable laboratory findings can include an elevated serum uric acid level and elevated serum zinc protoporphyrin level. Now, the first is caused by lead's interference with purine metabolism, whereas the second is caused by lead's interference with heme synthesis. In the real world, the workup for lead toxicity usually does not go beyond the labs listed on the previous slide. That being said, Examiners often expect students to know what lead poisoning can look like on a peripheral blood smear or a bone marrow biopsy. Hence, it's important to know that findings of basophilic stippling on a peripheral blood smear and or ringed sideroblasts on bone marrow biopsy are highly suggestive of lead poisoning. This is a peripheral blood smear from a patient with lead poisoning, and it depicts a microcytic hypochromic anemia along with basophilic stippling which is a phenomenon that describes these purplish blue dots within a red blood cell. These are actually precipitated ribosomes. And here's an image of a bone marrow aspirate under a Prussian blue stain from a patient with lead poisoning. Note these characteristic ringed sideroblasts. The blue dots observed around the nucleus occur due to the accumulation of iron inside the mitochondria. Recall from this diagram that lead exhibits the enzyme ferroketolase, thereby preventing conversion of protoporphyrin and iron into heme inside the mitochondria. Though iron can enter the mitochondria, it doesn't have a way to exit them. Hence, in cases of lead poisoning, it builds up inside the mitochondria, and thus stains blue under the Prussian blue stain of the bone marrow to give the appearance of ringed sideroblasts that were illustrated on the previous slide. The treatment of lead toxicity in adults begins with elimination of the environmental exposure to lead. The remainder of treatment revolves primarily around chelation therapy. Pharmaceutical options for adults include dimercaprol, also known as British anti-lewisite. Treatment also includes EDTA, succimer, which is also known as DMSA, and you can use penicillamine. Unfortunately, examiners expect students to know both names for dimercaprol and succimer, which is why it's important to remember them in order to recognize them correctly. So if you want to get the question right, really take the time to learn both of these names. Now of note, Activated charcoal is not indicated in recent ingestions of lead, as it has not been shown to be useful. So, with that in mind, examiners may occasionally include activated charcoal for treatment of lead poisoning as a wrong answer choice. Now, the treatment of lead toxicity in children depends entirely on the venous blood lead level. With mild poisoning, the clinician should recommend eliminating the potential source of lead exposure and then repeat a venous lead level in less than a month. With moderate poisoning, 
the current recommended treatment is with dimercaprol and EDTA, although succimer may be listed as the correct answer choice on examinations as well. Now, if it's severe, think dimercaprol and EDTA. And once again, it's important to memorize the blood lead levels associated with mild, moderate, and severe lead poisoning, because that can help guide you in appropriate treatment. A four-year-old girl is brought to the clinic by her mother to establish care. The family recently immigrated to the United States from Sudan. As part of the evaluation, a finger stick test is performed and reveals elevated lead levels. What is the next best step in management? Okay, so the child in the question is at risk for lead poisoning due to recent immigration to the United States, which is why the clinician ordered a screening finger stick test. So after that initial screening test is positive, then the next best step in management would be to order a venous blood level because you want to confirm the elevated blood lead level and determine the appropriate treatment, which is again based on the level of abnormality. So let's move on to arsenic toxicity. Arsenic toxicity is characterized by exposure to toxic amounts of arsenic. Fairly straightforward. Unlike lead, knowing the exact arsenic levels in the blood is not important for the boards, thankfully, which makes your job a little bit easier. Arsenic is a tasteless, odorless compound that can be absorbed via inhalation, ingestion, or skin contact. Now, once in the system, it is carried by red blood cells to various tissues and organs. There, it exerts its toxic effects primarily by binding sulfhydryl groups, which are on enzymes. And by binding to those and those enzymes, the enzyme's function is disrupted. And that can lead to inhibition of cellular respiration, gluconeogenesis, and glutathione metabolism. There are several important sources of exposure to arsenic that one should know for the boards. First, arsenic can be found in soil, which means that it can contaminate soil-derived foods such as rice. It can also escape from soil and rocks into drinking water, especially poorly managed well water. Second, arsenic can be found in various pesticides or insecticides. And since pesticides are often used to help preserve wood, pressure-treated wood can also be a source of arsenic exposure. Now, a common example of pressure-treated wood is wood used on outdoor fences. Now, third, exposure to arsenic dust can occur in various occupations, such as those that involve smelting, refining, or mining. Clinical features of arsenic toxicity can be broken down into acute, chronic, and latent toxicity. Acute toxicity can be manifest as neurologic symptoms, such as encephalopathy or seizures, or gastrointestinal symptoms such as abdominal pain or watery diarrhea. Now, arsenic toxicity can also lead to QT prolongation, which can quickly progress to torsades de point. And finally, patients with acute arsenic poisoning are often described as having garlic breath, which can actually be an important clue on the board. Now, chronic arsenic toxicity can lead to skin changes such as hypopigmentation, hyperpigmentation, or hyperkeratosis. It can also lead to symmetrical sensory polyneuropathy, often in stocking glove distribution, pancytopenia and hepatitis, and a unique finding known as Mies lines, which is characterized by horizontal white lines on the nails. Here's an example of what Mies lines look like on a physical exam. Notice the horizontal white lines on this nail that form due to the disruption of the nail matrix keratinization. Latent arsenic toxicity is defined as toxicity that happens after exposure to arsenic has actually already stopped. Now under this category, it's important to know the various cancers that have been associated with arsenic exposure in real life and on the boards. Now those are lung cancer, bladder cancer, hepatic angiosarcoma, basal cell carcinoma, and squamous cell carcinoma, particularly in the palmoplantar distribution. Just like with lead toxicity, the diagnosis of arsenic toxicity begins with a careful history and physical, looking for likely sources of arsenic exposure as well as signs or symptoms of arsenic poisoning. Unlike lead toxicity, blood testing is unreliable in the diagnosis because arsenic is actually cleared too quickly from the blood. Instead, urine arsenic levels can be obtained to support the diagnosis. And this test is considered a good measure of the current or recent arsenic exposure. Now finally, an ECG should be obtained in all patients with suspected arsenic poisoning because you're worried about QT prolongation. Now, the treatment of arsenic toxicity should begin upon clinical suspicion as most confirmatory tests take a long time to actually report the results. So the treatment begins with elimination of environmental exposures, which is fairly logical. You want to make sure this ongoing problem is no longer ongoing. And it often involves chelation therapy with either 
dimercaprol, succimer, or penicillamine. What are the key clinical features to help distinguish lead toxicity from arsenic toxicity? The clinical features of lead and arsenic toxicity in adults are very similar, and hence often confused on exams. So let's take a moment to delineate all the similarities and differences. Both lead and arsenic toxicity can lead to GI symptoms, neurologic symptoms, and anemia. Lead toxicity specifically can lead to nephropathy, type 2 renal tubular acidosis, and Burton's line, whereas arsenic toxicity can lead to QT interval prolongation, garlic breath, skin changes, thrombocytopenia, and leukopenia, hepatitis, and Mies lines. Knowing these key differences, along with key risk factors for each type of toxicity, will help you confidently distinguish lead poisoning from arsenic poisoning on the test. Let's move on to mercury toxicity. Mercury toxicity is characterized by exposure to toxic amounts of mercury. Again, fairly straightforward. Mercury exists in elemental, inorganic, and organic forms. Elemental form is absorbed primarily through inhalation, whereas the latter two forms are absorbed predominantly through the GI system. Now, once inside the system, mercury deposits primarily in the CNS, where it exerts oxidative damage and, similar to arsenic, binds sulfhydryl groups on enzymes and disrupt their function. The two most notable risk factors for mercury toxicity are occupational exposure, as can be seen in patients working in felt processing factories, thermometer manufacturing or mining, and consumption of fish with high mercury content such as tuna. Now, the latter risk factor is often tested in the setting of prenatal care, as all pregnant patients are counseled to avoid fish with high mercury levels due to its teratogenic effects. Similar to lead and arsenic toxicity, clinical features of mercury toxicity can include nonspecific neurologic symptoms, such as paresthesias, areflexia, or seizures. Unlike lead and arsenic, mercury toxicity can lead to a constellation of signs and symptoms commonly referred to as mad hatter disease, which is characterized by personality changes, ataxia, and tremors. Now, this disease is named this way because mercury toxicity used to be a common affliction among people working in felt processing plants. Now, since felt is used in making hats and affected workers at those plants were likely exhibiting unusual behaviors, the term mad hatter disease came about. Now, in addition to the neurologic symptoms, mercury toxicity can also lead to nephropathy. And if exposure took place via inhalation, then lung injury can occur. Most often, this is in the form of interstitial pneumonitis. Now, finally, mercury is considered a teratogen and has been linked to several adverse outcomes for the baby, such as microcephaly, cerebral atrophy, blindness, and mental delay. This is exactly why pregnant women are advised to stay away from fish with high mercury content. As with lead and arsenic, the diagnosis of mercury toxicity begins with a thorough history and physical exam looking for potential sources of exposure, as well as typical manifestations of mercury toxicity. Basic labs, such as a CBC and Comprehensive Metabolic Panel, or CMP, are usually ordered to evaluate for other potential toxicities, such as lead or arsenic toxicity. Exposure to mercury can be confirmed directly by ordering either a whole blood mercury level or a 24-hour urine mercury level. Though either of these tests confirms exposure, neither of them correlates with the severity of the toxicity. Now, finally, a chest X-ray can be ordered in cases of significant mercury inhalation because you want to evaluate the lungs. As with lead and arsenic, treatment of mercury toxicity begins with elimination of environmental exposures and often involves chelation therapy using either dimercaprol or succimer. Notably, clinicians should avoid using dimercaprol in cases of methylmercury exposure or in cases of extensive CNS involvement. And that's because dimercaprol can worsen neurologic toxicity in either of these cases because they actually increase mobilization of the mercury to the brain. A 45-year-old otherwise healthy male comes in to see his primary care provider with his wife who says that the patient has not been acting like himself lately. He works at an electrochemical plant and attributes his behavior to stress at work and old age. Physical examination is notable for intention tremor on finger-to-nose testing. When asked to run his right heel down the contralateral shin, the patient was unable to do so smoothly. What is the next best step in management? Now, it may be tempting to assume mercury poisoning based on the preceding slides and the fact that the patient in the question exhibits signs and symptoms suggestive of the so-called mad hatter disease. Now, the patient has not been acting like himself lately, which does qualify as a personality change. Also, 
He exhibited intention tremor on finger-to-nose testing, and he wasn't able to run his heel down the contralateral shin in a smooth fashion, which indicates ataxia. Now, despite these findings, it's important to not get tunnel visioned with these types of questions as examiners often test metal toxicities in relationship to one another. So the next best step in management would be to order basic labs, such as a CBC, a CMP, and consider other potential diagnoses such as lead toxicity. Naturally, a whole blood mercury level or a 24-hour urine mercury level can be ordered to confirm or rule out exposure to mercury. Now, similarly, a clinician may also order a venous lead level if there are reasons to suspect lead toxicity, as would be the case if the patient's CBC revealed microcytic anemia. Of note, working at an electrochemical plant does increase this patient's risk for mercury toxicity because phenylmercury can be used as part of the manufacturing process. So in answer to the question, what's the next best step? You should get some labs. Now let's move on to iron toxicity. For the purposes of this lecture, iron toxicity will be defined as ingestion of toxic amounts of iron. This can be either unintentional, such as when children take their parents' pills, or it can be intentional, such as when iron is ingested in a suicide attempt. Notably, systemic iron toxicity, secondary to primary or secondary hemochromatosis, are discussed separately in our lecture on diseases of the liver. When ingested in high amounts, iron causes direct caustic injury to the GI tract, which can lead to hypovolemia secondary to fluid and blood loss. This caustic injury to the GI tract can also lead to hemorrhagic necrosis, perforation, and peritonitis. Ingested iron can spread systemically and on a cellular level, it accumulates in mitochondria and leads to disruption of oxidative phosphorylation, lipid peroxidation, formation of free radicals, and eventually cell death. The risk factors for iron ingestion include unsupervised children or improperly stored medicines where children can easily access and open the containers. Young females are more at risk for ingestion of toxic amounts of iron because they're often prescribed oral iron either as part of prenatal care or as a treatment for iron deficiency anemia. Lastly, patients with suicidal ideation are at risk for ingestion as well, as iron is a supplement that can be purchased over the counter, so it's easy to obtain and overdose on. The clinical features of iron toxicity are generally subdivided into acute, subacute, and chronic. Acute features include gastrointestinal symptoms such as hematemesis or abdominal pain, which occur secondary to the direct caustic injury to the GI mucosa, like we mentioned before. Now, hypovolemia or even shock can occur secondary to significant fluid and blood loss, either as a result of vomiting or diarrhea, which can be bloody or non-bloody. And again, the bloody idea makes sense because, again, it directly damages the GI mucosa. Now, anion gap metabolic acidosis can occur due to iron's corrosive and cellular toxicity, or it can occur due to significant hypoperfusion of the tissues as a result of fluid loss, which can lead to lactic acidosis. Okay, so recall iron is part of the mud piles mnemonic of different factors that can lead to anion gap metabolic acidosis. So I for iron in mud piles, and it can also cause lactic acidosis, the L in mud piles. Now, if iron is allowed to persist in the GI tract and spread systemically, it can accumulate in the liver or kidneys, leading to hepatic dysfunction or hepatic necrosis, and also renal failure. Chronically, iron ingestion can result in pyloric stenosis or proximal bowel scarring. This can happen as a consequence of the healing process of the injured GI mucosa, particularly if the original damage was extensive. And the symptoms usually include severe abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, and general malaise. As with lead, arsenic, and mercury, the diagnosis of acute iron poisoning begins with a careful history and physical, followed by routine labs such as a CBC and CMP. Now, serum iron levels are typically ordered to confirm exposure to iron, and this value usually peaks four to six hours after ingestion. As mentioned on prior slides, iron ingestion can lead to anion gap metabolic acidosis, which would also be evident on the chemistry panel, the CMP. Now, if imaging is ordered, an abdominal x-ray may reveal iron in the GI tract, as would be the case if a child recently swallowed a bunch of iron tablets. Treatment for acute iron poisoning begins by addressing airway, breathing, and circulation. Supportive care must be provided to address fluid, electrolyte, or blood loss that can occur with ingestion of toxic amounts of iron. Now, other useful treatments include whole blood irrigation and chelation therapy with agents like deferoxamine, deferoxyrox, or deferoprone.
Note the fur part in the name of all three of these drugs. Generally speaking, all iron chelators will have fur somewhere in their name to help you recognize them as iron chelators on the test. Lastly, iron does not absorb to activated charcoal. So activated charcoal would not be useful in the management of acute iron ingestion. And with that in mind, activated charcoal is actually frequently used by examiners to be a distractor on tests. So remember that it's not useful in the management of iron ingestion. Here's a table summarizing the most salient and high yield concepts discussed in this lecture. You may find it useful to return to this table when reviewing metal toxicities before your tests. Now let's conclude this lecture with a multiple choice question. A 49 year old male is brought to the emergency department from work by his coworker. He says they were working their regular shift at the factory when the patient became confused and lethargic. Currently, the patient is awake, but appears somewhat confused. Review of records from the patient's primary care provider is notable for neuropathy in his feet. Most recent hemoglobin A1c was 5.9%. No other conditions are noted in his chart. Blood pressure is 134 over 75, pulse is 98 beats per minute, respiratory rate is 17 breaths per minute, and temperature is 37.2 degrees Celsius. Physical examination is notable for patchy areas of hypopigmentation and hyperpigmentation on his upper extremities and 1 plus patellar reflexes. A STAT ECG is ordered and reveals a QTC of 470 milliseconds. Which of the following laboratory findings would be most consistent with the patient's underlying diagnosis? A. Elevated zinc protoporphyrin levels, B. Pancytopenia, C. Elevated ferritin levels, or D. Elevated whole blood mercury level. So feel free to pause the video while you consider the answer. The correct answer is B, pancytopenia. This is a case of a factory worker who became confused and lethargic at work. His records indicate a history of neuropathy and a hemoglobin A1C level of 5.9%, which is high enough to call it pre-diabetes, but not high enough to call it diabetes. Hence, his neuropathy is unlikely to be caused by diabetes. So it's likely related to a toxic metal exposure at work. And his physical examination is notable for patchy areas of hypo and hyperpigmentation, as well as a diminished patellar reflex. And the ECG shows QT prolongation. Putting all of the clues together, this patient most likely experienced occupational exposure to arsenic and developed pancytopenia as a result, which is why option B is the correct answer. Now, option A is incorrect because elevated zinc protoporphyrin levels would be expected in a patient with lead poisoning, not arsenic poisoning. Recall lead inhibits the enzyme ferroketolase, which is responsible for combining protoporphyrin and heme to form hemoglobin. Now, inhibition of ferroketolase will lead to inhibition of heme synthesis and hence buildup of protoporphyrin in the system. Now, option C is incorrect because elevated ferritin levels would be expected in a patient with iron poisoning, not arsenic poisoning. Finally, option D is incorrect because mercury poisoning is less likely in this patient. Though the patient does exhibit neurologic symptoms that can be typical of mercury poisoning, his patchy areas of hypo and hyperpigmentation and his prolonged QT interval are inconsistent with mercury poisoning, which is why option D is incorrect. And that concludes our lecture on metal toxicity.